America's real estate industry is racing to build more homes, but builders are losing confidence in the market. Housing affordability is the primary challenge in the marketplace right now. And frankly, it's gonna get worse as interest rates increase. The cost of housing far exceeds what some of these essential employees, workers uh, need in order to have housing. Architects say that these and other concerns could ease over time with better planning. Suburban retrofitting has the potential to transform people's lives. What started as a fantasy concept for vacationers is now hitting Main Street USA. Developers call them mixed-use districts or master plan communities. The Howard Hughes Corporation just announced its purchase of 7,000 acres 30 miles outside the city for a master plan community. These new neighborhoods bring people closer to stores. The change could chip away at the country's larger issues. The central thing that everyone building suburbs fails to grasp is that this is a great one life cycle product. It's really not a multiple life cycle regenerative kind of thing. Can master planning solve the nationwide housing supply shortage? And what would it mean for the future of America's suburbs? The first thing to know is that nearly half of the renters in the country are struggling to pay their bills. We know that the laws of supply and demand drive housing prices. For too many years, the United States has not produced enough housing to meet the demands of a growing nation. The second thing to know is that more people are moving away from major cities to places like Fairfax, Virginia. I'd like for us to make houses more attainable for people. Evelyn Spain is a planning commissioner for Fairfax County, Virginia. It's a popular suburb outside of Washington, D.C. Fairfax County has over a million people, so you can imagine there's a lot to learn and a lot to apply to make life equitable and inclusive. Fairfax County is, in many ways, typical. It's still the, you know, single family home community, but it's, it's changing a little bit. The American city has been amazingly dynamic despite powerful built-in limitations on land use. Thinking about that old model of a dense uh, core where everybody works, that's a, that's a 20th century, if not a 19th century model. June Williamson has studied these new developments for over two decades. She calls them suburban retrofits. Part of what's driving retrofit is the understanding that this kind of growth machine paradigm that was pursued somewhat aggressively in the 20th century has kind of stalled out. And the rush to outlying areas has often been so great that the congestion of the highway has become as bothersome as the congestion of the city. These pre-existing properties that aren't generating the tax income that they had in the past, but they've already been heavily invested in, can be very carefully rethought and have new things layered into them. Among several of the highlights in her book is the Mosaic District. It feels less like a parking lot and more like a college campus. The developers there thought about making a better mix of uses and really making a destination that had a much higher percentage of public open amenity space. And part of this was in recognition that people can, can now shop at home and, and click on their computers just to, to have things delivered to them. But what's really missing is the opportunity to have social engagement with other people. If you walk through these new neighborhoods, it'll feel nice, maybe too nice. You know, gentrification is often a word that's used by people who are saying, okay, we're looking at this construction activity and we're thinking about cost concerns or traffic concerns and the like. But to young households, construction is the way that you add those, those homes of the future. And so a complaint that's often made is, well, you know, it's typically higher end housing that tends to be built. Well, the challenge is it's impossible to build 20 year old apartment buildings. The only way to get 20 year old apartment buildings is to build today. In places like Fairfax, long-term residents risk being pushed out to make room for new development. We also need to make housing more affordable for our aging community so they can age in place. Some of the most popular trends in city planning started in retirement communities. Developers call them master plans. I, I think the defining characteristic of a master plan community is a sense of neighborhood. Even Walt Disney had an idea for a new neighborhood that better mixed technology and daily life. But Walt never saw his idea realized. 
However, in the 1990s, the Walt Disney Company assembled a team of city planners, which in turn created Celebration Florida. This neighborhood has 26 miles of walking trails and an open air shopping center. There are about 10,000 residents in the community. Disney recently announced a major expansion in this space. The idea has been so popular that copycat retirement communities sprang up all around Florida. Today, the fastest selling master plan community is nearby. It's the villages. That's also the fastest growing metro area in the entire country. Companies like Blackstone have poured billions of dollars into real estate too. Blackstone's privately held real estate investment trust is spending big to repair old apartment buildings. And it launched a $1 billion affordable housing fund. Other investors like UMH Properties sell manufactured homes. The CEO says that taking production off-site saves a lot of money. Everything's based on location, age of community, all those things. But we're capable of providing the brand new houses low as $900, $950 per month. Investors are pouring money into these neighborhoods because they have hidden benefits. Take a look at this chart to see why. It's comparing the maintenance costs for a typical commercial lot versus something more like the Mosaic District. From the government's perspective, it's a no-brainer. The smart growth is more cost-effective. Still, these new designs are just a small share of the overall housing market. If you're thinking about the traditional master plan community, the big suburban development with thousands of units, that's only about three and a half percent of total single family starts. So it's a small share. You know, tear down construction, six percent. Now, two thirds of the home construction in this country is undertaken by small privately held companies. And they don't get a lot of attention. They're the ones out there building townhouses, building duplexes, doing tear down construction and remodeling our aging housing stock. Smaller developers like James Rouse brought master planning to the middle class with suburban cities. The developer created Columbia, Maryland, a city full of master planned communities. The 10 villages that comprise the city surround a big mall. People spend more time in a mall than they do anywhere else except home, more than they do in church, more than they do in school. Is that good or bad? Oh, well. You know, the problem that the new urbanists were trying to solve was really how to stop making bad suburbs. How do we create a better version of this thing that we are out building? The central thing that everyone building suburbs fails to grasp is that this is a great one life cycle product. It's really not a multiple life cycle regenerative kind of thing. The financial community believes that adding housing to older shopping centers could have a meaningful impact, both for their bottom line and for the public good. Dead malls and sleepy retail districts have become a common issue in America. I think we often neglect to recognize that we actually have created a development pattern that is a throwaway development pattern. It is a one generation of success and prosperity, and then essentially we walk away from it and allow it to you know, go through a cycle of decline. Maybe if it's located well enough, we'll, we'll do some heroic thing to rescue it, but we're basically just allowing it to fall apart. That comes with all kinds of costs, related costs, social costs, political costs, cultural costs, economic costs. Charles Marone has compared U.S. land development to a Ponzi scheme. He made this chart to summarize the problem. After one or two life cycles, infrastructure maintenance costs add up, sinking public budgets. That can put local governments in a tough position. They have to either add debt or raise taxes. Planners believe that there's a better way. So it's really about diversifying these places and adding other choices for which we believe unmet demand does exist. Whether it's a medium density townhouse community that's more of an urban village or a suburban, exurban master plan community that has a large amount of housing, these are all ways of capturing economies of scale from the development and the construction perspective. If you have a business that has a bad business model, Will growth help it? Yeah, well, growth will help it next quarter, next year. Like, growth is going to help, but unless you fix that business model, it's really just going to bankrupt a lot more people. Marone believes that towns across the country have been covered by bailouts from higher levels of government. For example, federal spending covers the cost of capital for road building if you bring a highway to your neighborhood. As a result, Northern Virginia looks like this. 
And those highways impact more than the budget. Commercial developers have long tried to build neighborhoods that encourage walking over driving. There are many reasons for that. Sedentary lifestyles associated with suburban form produce heightened risks of obesity and diabetes, dying in car crashes, developing addictions, and modest amounts of physical activity, which can be encouraged and supported by how we, we build places and plan them, are a really low-cost cure. Still, one development can't change the status quo. The Mosaic District is still in an excerpt. The legacy of road building in Northern Virginia has made it unsafe for pedestrians in some cases. The local planning commissions want to make walking safer. What if a person has trouble walking or what if a person has trouble hearing? How do they gain access to these new opportunities, to the, to the new housing that's coming in place in our communities? Things like that we need to be more aware of. While these new suburbs have rolled out across the country in recent years, home builders are looking at a tough market ahead. They say that sourcing quality labor and building materials has never been more difficult. Housing affordability is the primary challenge in the marketplace right now. And frankly, it's gonna get worse as interest rates increase uh, this year. The ability to, to build with density, to build with scale, are ways that you can bend the cost curve in the right direction and add more housing to the market. The reality is, is we're gonna have fewer road miles two decades from now than we have today. We're gonna have fewer streets, fewer pipes, fewer things that we have to maintain because they're gonna fall apart and we're not gonna fix them because we don't have the money. Still, many are searching for solutions. I think it really is important to have that longer time horizon in mind so that we're not arguing about our our past values and desires, but, but about the future. Of course, design matters. A skilled architect, a skilled urban designer can introduce these different housing types and have them blend in and appear very compatible with detached standalone houses. But to be inclusive, we need to think about everybody and how everyone is gonna be affected by the new development here.